So we will uh, start the ceremony in here with some sharing about the Buddha Hall. I know that Venerable Children's not so happy about being in the center, and yet this whole Buddha Hall really is your idea. <laughs> And so we're all here to help. But given that it is your idea, um, if you'll just share with us the purpose. Why are we building a Buddha Hall? What is the point? And what's the meaning for the community? And what's the meaning for the world? Uh, well, I think you experienced today some of the reason we're building the Buddha Hall, which is uh, we had the teachings in the dining room. Yeah. And uh, so our, our typical, our usual uh, meditation hall, just up there a little, a few steps, it's too small now when we have retreats and a lot of people come, people are squished in. And then even just for regular daily programs, uh, we don't have Wi-Fi up there, so we can't lie, you know, stream things. And then also it, it's too small, so we started having things in here. And it's not optimum to have Dharma classes in the dining room. Uh, you make do with it, yeah, but you don't want to continue this for long. And so we need a larger space where the whole community can practice. And we also need um, different meditation halls for different purposes. So different people sometimes have different needs and uh, it's sometimes difficult to find rooms where they can meditate in. Yeah. And so in the new hall, we will have a large central um, hall which will be very nice so when you do prostrations you aren't climbing all over the person next to you and in front of you and back of you. Uh, and then we will have a posade hall where the monastics do the monastic uh, ceremonies, ordination and our bi-monthly um, uh, purification and restoration of precepts. Uh, we'll have another hall uh, specially dedicated for Tara, and then another uh, hall called the uh, Dedication Hall, which is where people can go and make dedications for uh, their deceased loved ones or for projects that they want to do, places where people can go on your own and, and sit and meditate, and we'll have different practices out that people can do for different occasions. Yeah, uh, So we need that space. We don't have it here. And our library, if you've been here uh, at all, the library is in the room with the, um, the lift. Yeah, not so convenient also. Uh, the library in the back is uh, only for the... Um, the residents and the library out here is for the guests, but again, the guests are in the dining room in a place where people are walking. They don't have a space to sit and, and really read uh, comfortably and silently. So we'll have quite a large library uh, in the new hall. We'll have um, places for listening to tapes and a media room. So for the community and, and everybody who comes, all the guests, you know, the Buddha Hall will be really quite a significant um, a thing that facilitates the learning and practice of the Dharma. We want the Abbey to exist for mm, 10,000 years at least. The building will be very strong and hopefully will last a long time because part of our purpose here for the Abbey is not just the people who practice now and uh, to spread the Dharma now and, and let other people or enable other people to have contact with these beautiful teachings, but to establish, to root the Buddha Dharma in the West um, by having a monastic community and then make it make this a place where for years and centuries to come many people can come and practice. So at some time maybe uh, we'll have so many monastics here that that will be 
uh, too small, and uh, they'll have to build the big one down the road or something really big. Okay, but it's we're doing it not just for ourselves, but for many, many generations to come, and uh, also because knowing that there's a monastery is very inspiring to people. We get a lot of mail uh, where people just say, thank you for existing. You know, when I'm upset or something's bothering me, I know you people are there and I can go there and I know, you know, there's some people on this planet meditating on love and compassion for all beings and that inspires me when I read the newspaper. You know, just to, to have it so that the Dharma is available to people um, in this country and hopefully, hopefully to uh, live according to our little slogan to create peace in a chaotic world. And a project that is happening at the same time that is not publicized because it's really more of an internal thing, but it's also very important, is the construction of Meta Cabin which um, Venerable Sangye Kadro is um, supervising, organizing, and will inhabit. So I'd just like for you to talk a little bit, Venerable, about um, the Buddha Hall, too, and also Meta Cabin and the importance of that for you. So um, I've known Venerable Chudran since the mid-'70s. Um, we both met at Kopan Monastery in Nepal. And so Venerable Children has invited me to come here, and finally I had a chance a couple of years ago to come and visit Sarvasti Abbey, and I really liked it. I love it, in fact. <laughs> Not only is it beautiful physically and peaceful and quiet, but it's just a beautiful community, very harmonious and very dedicated to Dharma. And I can really say, you know, I've been a lot of places. This is the most conducive situation I have ever encountered for, especially for a female monastic, but also for Dharma in general. Um, the conditions here are really excellent. So I thought, well, maybe I can settle down here. And I spoke with Venerable Children about building a little cabin. And the idea was to build it at the same time as, um, as the Buddha Hall. Because for one thing, cost-wise, every time you have to bring a vehicle up here, like digging or pouring cement. It's a huge amount of money, not to mention uh, damage to the environment. <laughs> so it would be much more effective, um, you know, to have the two projects going on at the same time. Yes. And and also, so Met Cabin, the idea is it would be a place for me to live while I'm here, but it will belong to the Abbey. So um, when I'm gone, then it can be used for uh, residents to do retreat or whatever yeah, whatever they would like to use it for. So I really like that idea that it isn't mine, it's the Abbey's, but I can just use it while I'm around. <laughs> yeah, and I'm very excited about the Buddha Hall. It's going to be incredibly beautiful. Um, yeah, and this spot is so nice as well. So incredible views and forest and peace and quiet. So it's going to be a wonderful, a wonderful hall for us to study and practice the Dharma. Um, let's stay with a philosophical view for a moment and ask uh, Geshe Dadula to speak. Uh, it's a great honor uh, to be part of such an enterprise, uh, such a project that would have a very, very uh, long-lasting effect in a positive sense, not just merely to the Buddhists, but to all sentient beings across the world, across the universe, if you will. Uh, in that, uh, Buddhism has so much to uh, so much to provide, so much to uh, give, uh, like many other religions have, and uh, so but different. So that adds to the diversity, and thus uh, this place, as has always been, uh, be uh, open to those who are looking for learning from the Buddhist science, uh, mainly the uh, mind science. It has been open like this and has been attracting people from all over the world. That's how it has grown so much uh, within very sh such a short time. Uh, when you speak of Depung, Depung, that's my monastery in India, uh, it has gone through three stages, three, four stages of building Buddha Hall. Uh, <laughs> early on, it had only 216 monks from Tibet, and then it was... Uh, that building was outgrown with m new uh, enrollments, 
and then they built a medium one. Not medium, for them it was the biggest one. But then over the years it turned out to be too small. <laughs> too small. Now they have built uh, yeah, beautiful, very big one. Big one. Even that is filling up. Even that is filling up. So when Venerable is looking forward to thousands of years, I'm for sure there will be time when we will have to build a bigger one. But, <laughs> but for now, uh, housing as it is, uh, uh, calculated uh, to do uh, 200 monastics at the least, uh, would be good enough uh, to sustain through maybe a few decades. Uh, not centuries, but a few decades. And then, having been here several times, what I have found here is balance environment in that the monastics are exposed to the very profound, vast scriptures, yet at the same time they have uh, enough allotted time for internalizing it. So in all of this, I find Venerable Chodun La very, very responsible and very much uh, to be credited for because of her able and caring leadership, plus her exemplary practical dharma, practical experiences, and the fortune of having met with authentic dharma giants in the genuine Tibetan tradition. So in all of those respects, she has, uh, she has uh, shown the ability uh, and the care that she, that, that, uh, she possesses, but at the same time feel very assured that it is backed up by a wealth and wealth of many years of experience, practice. Uh, so based on this, I have great hope and great uh, expectation from this Buddha Hall. <laughs> it's like the beautiful analogy in the Buddhism when you use, you put a drop of water. I don't know how true that is scientifically. I have to look into that. But when you put a drop in the ocean, it lasts as long as the ocean lasts. <laughs> you cannot say it's there, there, it's not there, it's not there, not there. Likewise is the case. Any extending help that you could make in any form through you, through your friends, through the friends of yours and others, uh, would be uh, a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to make one more way of making most of this precious human life that we have. With all this, I want to extend my best and deepest, sincerest wishes for the whole project to go smooth and furthermore for its activities to flourish all over. Thank you. I would like to start by saying that there's a key person missing from this group right now, and it is Venerable Tarpa. And through the beauty of Wi-Fi, she is absolutely engaged 24-7 on this project. And so we're really, really uh, happy that she has the expertise that she has. Um, the other person that's been so important in this whole process is our architect, Tim Wilson who is the lead person at Momentum Architecture in Coeur d'Alene. And this is the third building that Tim has designed for the Abbey. And it has been a beautiful experience just seeing him listen to Venerable Children and Venerable Tarpa. And those discussions began in the spring of 2019. And it was just, it's just beautiful how he listens. And he really, really listens. And then he gives guidance based on what he is hearing from the Abbey community. Uh, so, practicalities. We're very, very concerned about preserving the environment and being environmentally sensitive and using pr just products that are kind to the environment. Venmal Chodron was talking about the Foswall system that we'll use. So this system was used um, in Venmal Chodron's little home, Prajna House, and it was used for the building that we're in, Chenrezi Hall. And the beauty of this product is that 85% of this 
block right here is smashed up wooden pallets that have been, the wood has been demineralized. So it's 85% wood, and then they mix in a concrete kind of gravel mix, and then there's this insulation piece. And with all of that, then the wall is actually one foot thick, and this is going to prevent forest fires from eating up the building, and insects can't penetrate one foot of concrete and rebar and that, and it's also a, a material that breathes. So the R value for a FOS wall system, a wall system is very, very high. And then in conjunction with that, we have a heating and cooling system that is geothermal. The lower floor of the building will be heated with a radiant floor heating system. So we're excited about that. So obviously the Dharma is first and foremost as what's, what the reason is for the building, and we want Venerable Children's Voice heard without her trying to project and strain her voice and so that people all over the planet can hear the teachings too. But I am absolutely 100% confident that with our team, Threshold Acoustics, the sound will be beautiful and clear. So I think that's, those are the key points. So you can't have a temple without the beautiful art of the temple. And uh, Venerable Damcho is going to uh, both tell us about the outside decoration and then introduce Peter, who's... Uh, our special guest. So before we go into that, I just wanted to say this is definitely not Venerable Children's idea alone. I'm guessing she's, no, she's prayed for it for eons and eons and made all the merit and dedication. So first we have to thank all your past continuums um, <laughs> that led up to this. And of course, we are not here by accident. Yeah, all of you are here because you created the cause to be here. And yeah, so that always just sticks out for me. She, Venerable's given this wonderful talk in the past about how this place would not exist if sentient beings did not need it. So this hall's not gonna get built if sentient beings don't need it. So hopefully you do, because <laughs> we do. <laughs> and that, yeah, we create those causes together. Um, so yes, yeah, one very um, exciting thing that I've been involved in in this project, aside from attending long, long meetings about AV equipment that I don't understand, um, is helping to bring some of the holy objects uh, to the Buddha Hall. So this is a picture of a traditional Tibetan temple. This is the Nyingma Monastery across from Sekong Labrang in South India. Um, and as you well know, most of the architecture here is very much in line with the Pacific Northwestern style, but we're going to add a little twist and bring some roof ornaments from the traditional Tibetan uh, monasteries to the Buddha Hall. So you'll see the two deer and a Dharma wheel in the middle that's going to sit on like a parapet above the main entrance. And then behind that, you'll see some what are called ganjiras. And later on, I'll explain the symbology of that. But I was thinking this morning about the deer and Dharma wheel. You know, um, the Dharma wheel just represents the Buddha's turning the wheel of the Dharma, teaching that um, at a place called Deer Park. Yeah, so that it's, that's a significant to us as Buddhists. But I think in some ways, maybe it will purify the hunting culture here too. <laughs> and so we're creating a very different universe with the Buddha Hall, with these beautiful deer and the Dharma wheel. Yeah, you'll see this is the um, artisan who is making them in Nepal. The work is already underway. Um, they are gold-plated in that picture. We do not have the funds to gold-plate them. So we'll have them. They're made of copper, and they'll be shipped here. And we're going to take them to a car, fa uh, car shop to get spray-painted. <laughs> so we'll, we'll look for that. Yeah, don't tell anyone. It's not real gold. But again, we'll purify the car-making industry. You don't have to make your car fancy. You can spray some deer and Dharma wheels. <laughs> It'll be an interesting experience for them and us, I think, when it happens. We'll see. So this is um, a ganjira. The part at the bottom is a lotus base, which is the seat that all the Buddhas sit on. And then the other parts above that represent the five Buddha families. So you have a bell that represents Amoga Siddhi, and then another lotus above that representing Amitabha, and then a vase uh, representing Akshobhya, and then a wheel representing Verochana, and then a jewel representing Ratnasambhava. So that was a lot of strange terms for you. Just know this represents like every possible Buddha you can imagine, <laughs> and they are all sitting on the roof of the Buddha hall, you know, so that's the kind of presence we're coming into. There's a really important person who's here right now helping us to bring the big Buddha here. I mean, what are the odds of you seeing a Buddha in Newport? Well, <laughs> right, this, well, it's going to happen. And so maybe I'll let Peter Griffin here um, tell you a bit more. We've been working very closely with him. He has a lifetime of experience creating Buddhas <laughs> and bringing them into the world. He works with his wife, Denise. Um, 
and they're both very talented sculptors. And uh, we learned about them through the thousand arm Chen Rezi that they made for uh, Amitabha Buddhist Center in Singapore. That's very beautifully documented and it's quite remarkable. And then so Peter's been working very hard on creating the three main statues for the main altar. And yeah, we'll let you, him tell you more about them. I was very thrilled to be asked and greatly honored actually. Um, uh, particularly because one of the statues is actually very rare and it should be more popular. But uh, Mahapajapati, who is the aunt of Lord Buddha and the first nun, which is very important. So, yeah, no, I was very happy to, um, to be contacted and to take it on. I must say it's been um, one of the most enjoyable statue projects I've started to work on as well. And also um, my, my teacher, who's also my statue teacher, Lama Zoparimshi, he once said that you can tell the karma of a project as to how well the statue projects go, or the art projects in general. And sometimes there are lots and lots of obstacles. I mean, really, a lot of obstacles. Anything that can go wrong does go wrong. Um, but with this one, there's not been a single obstacle so far. So, so my, my workshop's in, in, um, in France, in, in a big Dhamma community in France. And um, I've started to build the statues there. Um, so this, this is the beginning of them. Um, so on the left is Ananda, at the back, Ananda, and then Mahapachapati. And then I've started to make the, the statue of Lord Buddha as well, Buddha Shakyamuni. Um, it's really hard to show in, a, in photographs. But they they're arriving on Friday. So the two, the two standing statues are... Uh, they're at a point where I can finish them quite quickly. So Mahapajapati, um, she holds a, a begging bowl in her left hand and then the staff in her right hand. Um, and Buddha Shakyamuni is happening quite quickly. So thank you very much. It's been a great honor to, to work on and to meet you all. Thank you very much. We have a tradition here at the Abbey that the Buddhas appear before the buildings do. Um, even when Venerable Children was was looking for a place to found the abbey, the um, Buddhas, the tankas that are that you see hanging in our meditation hall now, were offered before there was even a land for Shravasti Abbey. So the Buddhas, in, and so we've had this similar experience through several buildings, including this one. So it's like the the presence or the arrival of the Buddhas heralds the next kind of blossoming of what's happening at the monastery. So today we have a, a beautiful opportunity to unveil one of the Buddhas who has arrived at the abbey before the um, building is ready. And I'll let Venerable Shudran actually tell the story of this Manjushri Tanka. So Manjushri is the, the Buddha of wisdom and uh, his practice was one that's very popular uh, in the Tibetan tradition. And in the monasteries when you wake up, all the little monks are saying Manjushri mantra, and I'm like that. And it's to clear the mind and uh, dispel hindrances and increase one's wisdom. So, uh, <laughs> so we had a, uh, a Maitreya tanka, and we wanted a Manjushri tanka that was that would match you know, about the same size and so on, to go in the main hall. So um, so our friend Jason from Singapore, who has his fingers in I don't know how many projects, but he seems to know a lot of people. Um, and he, he offered us the Chenrezig Tanka that is downstairs in the foyer. Uh, and we thought that one was, the, the artistry on that one was so beautiful. So we asked him about it. He put us in contact with the artist in uh, Dharamsala. So you can see the video of how the artist went step by step in the traditional way of painting um, Manjushri. You know, because you have to have very specific measurements. You can't, it isn't freestyle modern art kind of thing, but very specific. And uh, he's really quite a a competent um, artist and Peter talking about things going very smoothly the painting uh, you know the painting coming into being 
It just happens so easily. You know, no bumps in that one. It, to me, it's just amazing somebody has that kind of motor skill, to, and plus the inner vision of the deity to, to do these lines so that when you look at the, at the Buddha's eyes, you see Manjushri. You don't see a painting. Yeah. Uh, so we were very fortunate that he did, he did the painting. Yeah, so if everyone would like to just line up and come look and kind of pay your respects if you wish, and then we can uh, uh, gather to start moving up the hill.